Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH Virtual Event Space. Here with Taylor Stone, who is a PhD researcher and professional photographer. I throw that PhD researcher in there because, Taylor, I, I know you've referred to yourself as almost like a PhD researcher foremost rather yeah. than professional photographer, right? That's an, it's an important part. I mean, you, you have the, the technical chops to back up the photography thing. So we're going to probably hear about some of that today. We're talking long exposure photography. Uh, again, a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Nisi. So if you do have any questions on any Nisi products, uh, feel free to get those in. We do have Jim hanging in the background there who will be able to answer any technical questions related to the products. But I want to welcome you on today, Taylor. We're talking long exposures and how to make your long exposure game better. So I'm going to be tuned in because I know nothing about this. This is not my area <laughs> of expertise. It's yours. So huge welcome to you. Um, any questions we will get to at the end. If you do have something throughout, feel free to get it in. And uh, if it's something that's pertinent to what Taylor's talking about at the time, we will, of course, jump in and get that question asked. But all else was standing, we will address all those questions at the end. But Taylor, the show is yours. Thank you so much, Derek. I really appreciate all of you guys having me here and everyone who's watching. I love doing these chats so I can get to know more new people, new faces and interact with a whole new group. So please uh, never hesitate to reach out to me. And Derek, thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, I am a self-professed giant nerd and uh, I, I really do lead with the, the research and the analytical side in my photography because for me, all the science, everything that I've learned through my PhD work, which I'll discuss a little bit during the presentation, it informs everything that I do with my photography. So definitely a full picture approach uh, whenever I create art. So let's get started. All right, so today we are gonna be talking about capturing the passage of time and how you can use long exposures to elevate your photography to the next level. So uh, as Derek mentioned, I am Taylor Stone. The first trick to finding me online is whether or not you can properly spell my name. So there is no Y in it, it's T-A-L-O-R. And my contact information is down there at the bottom. And I just wanna thank B&H Photo for having me here, but also Nisi and Jim at Nisi Filters for having me here as well. So I'll be talking a little bit about their products uh, throughout the presentation. And of course, if you have questions about any products, uh, you can ask them in the chat and Jim will help you with that. So an overview of what we're talking about today, we're gonna to be talking about what it means to capture time and why it's such a cool thing to add to your photography. And then I'll be using my passion project in the Blue Ridge Mountains to be a foil for our discussion. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the process and tools that I use to photograph waterfalls. So a little bit about myself. Um, photography is my second career, but it was always a childhood dream of mine. So I came to it a little bit later, but it has totally taken over my life. Um, I'm also a full-time PhD researcher. I'm about halfway through my PhD program and my focus, if you'll bear with me being nerdy for a moment, is on how climate change is impacting the indigenous people of Greenland. So I'm really excited about this topic. I love everything that I research and it gives me a reason to go to Greenland all the time. So that is just nothing to complain about. I also love the education portion of my job, which is why I love doing these webinars, but I also teach workshops and I just look for any opportunity that I can bring people into photography and be in that educator role uh, and make photography a really inclusive space for everyone. And of course, I am an ambassador for Nisi, who makes, in my opinion, some of the best optical glass on the market. And of course, I just am a silly person. I never take myself too seriously. I always just try and bring that positivity and energy out there in the field. So if you ever spot me out there, there's a good chance I'm just gonna be goofing off and having a good time. That's just the way I roll. Um, and I just got back yesterday from a three and a half month trip across the Southwest doing workshops. Um, I did over 15,000 miles in this little setup. So that is my teardrop trailer. It is four feet by six feet. Um, so it is very small, but uh, it's been a wild ride. So hopefully if you've been following along, you'll see all the crazy stories and the adventures with my little trailer. 
a little bit about my style. I focus a lot on themes of transition and, and this connects back to my academic work because I'm looking at climate change a lot in academia. So I look for these types of transitional moments in nature when I'm pursuing photography. Um, also, I'm kind of more of a purist in the sense of just, I try and portray the landscape in an honest way. I try and represent it without any type of structural alteration. So anything that you see in my images is what was actually there. And what you can expect today, today is not meant to be a technical presentation. So I don't think any of us came prepared to do math today. And that's okay. This isn't the best form for learning those skills. So um, there are many resources online if you want to learn the mathematical side of calculating long exposures. So today we're going to be talking more about the broader concept and the way in which you can implement these skills. And of course, at the bottom of all my images, I will have some detailed exposure information in case you're curious about what my settings were to make that particular shot. And primarily, we're just going to be discussing how you can use that dimension of time to elevate your image to the next level with the goal of just hopefully inspiring you to grab your filters and get out there and try something new uh, with your photography. Hopefully we can spice it up a little bit. So without any further ado, we'll just hop right on in. Um, so one of the greatest challenges in all of photography is how you can take a three dimensional space and translate it onto a two dimensional format. So how do you make a world that's full of depth and nuance? How do you make it feel real when it's printed on a piece of paper? And of course, there's good compositional techniques to help you achieve this, like getting a good foreground, midground, and background to lead the viewer through your image. There's also leading lines that can help make the image feel multidimensional uh, and pull the viewer through it. But what if you could add a fourth dimension to your image? Something more than the X, Y axis and a little bit of depth. What if you could add the dimension of time? So really cool tool, ND filters allow you to do exactly that. Uh, they help you extend your shutter speed so you can photograph the passage of time through your image. And when you actually apply these techniques, then you're stepping into this whole new genre of photography called creative long exposures. And creative long exposures reveal this world that is invisible to the naked eye. It's literally allowing your viewer to time travel through your image. And it's taking four dimensions and it's putting it into this 2D medium that we call photography. So it's a really cool technique. As far as I'm concerned, it's basically magic. And that's why I love applying long exposure techniques to my photography. You can use it for all kinds of things like seascapes, uh, blurring traffic. You can use it to show human interaction through nature using traffic trails again. Uh, you can soften the water in a, in a landscape to kind of evoke a more serene or tranquil mood. Of course, you can blur the clouds, which is a whole different technique. Um, and my very favorite, waterfalls. I love taking pictures of waterfalls. I never get tired of the challenge and the many different ways that you can apply long exposures to your waterfall images to create a really ethereal effect. So when you're photographing time, you're really stepping beyond freezing a moment. I often hear when people talk about why they love photography. One of the things I, I have heard most often is I just want to capture a moment. I love being able to freeze a moment in time. And I think that's awesome. I also love that aspect of photography, but I find long exposures exciting because you're not freezing a moment. You're packing an entire passage of time into an image. You're literally time traveling through your photo. And for me, that's really exciting and very challenging. Um, so you're capturing the passage of time itself in your image. When you add the dimension of time, it does several things for your photo that's gonna help elevate it to the next level. And using this image here, I'll, I'll go through a couple of them. The first one is that it provides contrast that otherwise was not present in your scene. 
In this particular image, you have the contrast between the sharp rock and then the smoothness of the water. And without a long exposure, you really can't get that textural contrast in your image because the water is going to be rough and chaotic. But when you extend your shutter speed, in this case to a full second, then you get this beautiful textural contrast in your image that you can't get otherwise. The second thing is that it creates new compositional elements that you can't see with your naked eye. This is probably my favorite thing about long exposures is that I love thinking strategically when I approach a scene to see whether or not using a long exposure can create something that isn't there otherwise. For example, in this image, this beautiful curve uh, coming down from the top of the waterfall all the way out to the bottom corner of the image, that curve really isn't present unless you do a long exposure because you don't get that nice silky white tone in the water. So when you create a long exposure, all of a sudden I have created this new compositional element, which is really exciting. The third is that you can alter the emotional tone of your image by using long exposures. Now, I'll talk about this a little more in depth in a moment, but altering and controlling the emotional tone is how you take photography from simply being photography to being an expression of art. When I look at an image like this, I mean, I think it's absolutely beautiful. The light is just perfect. And I want to convey how ethereal this moment is. Using a long exposure is gonna soften the water and take a scene from being potentially chaotic with crashing water everywhere to all of a sudden being this very uh, relaxing and calming photo that the viewer can really just soak in. So the fourth thing is that I think you're letting the viewer time travel through your image and that's pretty darn cool. I mean, we don't get to time travel in our regular lives so why not be able to do it through art? So whenever you are creating a long exposure, you're creating something that your viewer's eye literally cannot see without this long exposure, which is the passage of time. So letting your viewer time travel through this image is letting your viewer connect with it in a way that they can't otherwise. So you're creating this new experience for your viewer. And when you combine all these things, you're basically creating an image that's, in my opinion, it's magic. So remember how I mentioned it alters the emotional tone of your image. This is what I mean by that. These photos were taken minutes apart. So you have identical conditions, almost very similar location that I'm shooting. I basically just pivoted and turned the other way. Um, but you have a completely different feeling from these photos. So on the one on the left, we have a quick shutter speed and you can really get the sense of the crashing waves. It's very dynamic. Um, it's very chaotic feeling and you can feel kind of the anger of the ocean through that photo. But on the right hand side, I've taken this ocean and turned it into this very calming experience by extending my shutter speed. It's very tranquil, it's relaxing. The viewer can focus on the foreground um, and just how soft the clouds are. So I've created a very different experience for my viewer, but I'm basically in the same place. So when you're using long exposures, you can completely transition the way in which the emotional tone of your image moves from dynamic, uh, active, to calming, tranquil, and serene. In another example here, uh, I have various shutter speeds, which I've just played around with. These are just unedited images, but um, you can see how these different shutter speeds have impacted the image in a different way. So you have two and a half seconds. It's just enough to smooth the water, but there's no cloud movement. 30 seconds, you start to get a little bit of movement in the clouds. And then once it's extended to a full minute, you get this beautiful range of motion as the clouds streak across the sky. And you can really get a sense for how fast they're moving. So you can look at this and think about how you can apply this to images to create emotional tone of racing clouds, it makes it feel very dynamic and fast moving. So as you can see, there's many ways that you can apply long exposures to your images to really translate them into 
moving from just a photo of a landscape to your own individual interpretation of what that landscape is. So now that we've chatted a little bit about how long exposures can elevate your images, I wanna talk about a passion project of mine. In case you didn't notice, 2020 wasn't exactly a normal year. Um, you know, normally I am out with workshops and I'm traveling a lot and all of a sudden the sands of time just poured a little bit more slowly and I was stuck pretty much in my geographical area down here in the Southeast. So I needed a passion project and something that would keep photography alive for me and keep myself really excited to get out on my camera all the time. And a passion project is gonna let me do a couple of things. Uh, and I highly advocate that you, you do this for yourself. Passion projects are such incredibly helpful ways to reconnect with your photography. So I was looking for a way to just shoot for the joy of it and just really reconnect with nature, with areas that I love and with photography itself and find new ways to explore the tools that I use. So one of the things that interested me at the beginning of the pandemic is that our perception of time is really weird. Perception of time is subjective, it's very fluid. And when everything shut down, there's a good chance for you that you experience time differently than possibly your neighbor or other people that you know. If you worked in the medical field, there's a really good chance that Time just went super fast and everything was a blur. But if you're like me in the travel industry, there's a good chance that time slowed down for you and each day just drug on and on. So think for yourself whether or not this time in your life was a blur or was it a year that just wouldn't end. And this subjective perception of time, that's pretty fascinating. So I decided to explore this with my camera and I wanted to figure out a way that I could interpret my perception of time through uh, the tools that I had at my disposal, which is my camera. So I chose the Blue Ridge Mountains. Um, there were a couple of reasons that I did this. The first is that it's very close to home for me. Um, so I knew it was gonna be a COVID safe activity. These are very remote areas and I could just go out there and camp and hike by myself and spend a lot of time just me and these beautiful waterfalls. Uh, and it's perfect for long exposures. The Southern Blue Ridge Mountains are home to one of the highest concentrations of waterfalls anywhere on earth. So there is no shortage of subject matter to explore the concept of time. And of course, redemption. So <laughs> this picture was taken shortly after my first trip to the Blue Ridge Mountains several years ago. Uh, I spent all afternoon photographing a waterfall and as you can see here it ended in tragedy. My camera, my Fuji at the time, um, it well my entire camera bag managed to fall off of a rock and float over a waterfall. <laughs> uh, don't even ask me how that happened. Honestly, I had my back turned. I'm not even sure how the bag rolled off of the rock, but it went sailing right down that river. It was February, it was freezing cold. I chased it all the way down the river as it floated down um, and I managed to recover the bag, but the camera was not to be saved. So I needed some redemption. It was time for me to revisit the Blue Ridge Mountains and try and create some new, much more positive memories of this beautiful place. So the project itself, um, I kept my goals really simple because this is a passion project and it's supposed to be fun. So my goal was just to reconnect with nature and of course, achieve some redemption. So create some positive memories. Um, and I just wanted to shoot for the love of it while I'm exploring this new theme, which is time and figure out ways in which I can use the passage of time in my images to create powerful composition. So I wasn't even really that concerned with creating portfolio quality images or pursuing, you know, the classic Instagram banger. I was out there to just have a good time. And it turns out I learned an awful lot. Um, so here's a short video of just what my day looked like out there. And it went like.
as you can see, there was no shortage of subject matter, uh, just beautiful waterfall after beautiful waterfall. Um, I went up there, I was just camping by myself, hiking, um, having these incredible landscapes all to myself. And that was really a special time to be up there. And it gave me a lot of time to just buckle down and focus on my goal, which was how do I photograph time in the most compelling way possible? So I mentioned that I learned a lot along the way, and I really did. Um, I wanted to master this skill. Um, before starting this passion project, I used long exposures a fair amount. You know, I was pretty familiar with the technique, but I had never really set aside a dedicated time to fully focus on just this one skill. And it's one of the reasons that I advocate anyone pick up a passion project of their own, because it creates the space for you to just put everything that's distracting you to the side and really focus on one thing to help lift your photography up. So I'm gonna share a couple of the things that I learned. And um, the first thing sounds really obvious, but I promise it's, it's so essential that people often overlook it, is that the time of day you go out there to photograph waterfalls matters a lot. In, in any type of photography, time of day matters. We've heard of golden hour and shooting at sunrise and sunset. But when you're taking long exposures of moving water, the importance of this is elevated. Um, direct light on moving water is not its best friend. So it's so essential that you do diligent planning in advance to get good long exposure images. Um, so researching in advance is absolutely essential. And this goes directly towards knowing how the light is going to impact your image. So does your waterfall, does it face north or south or east or west? Is it gonna be better at sunrise or sunset because of that orientation? So if a waterfall is facing east, you know it's gonna be really hard to shoot it in the morning. So you may wanna plan for that waterfall to be in the afternoon when the light is indirect on it. So for example, in this particular image, I knew that there was a small cave behind this waterfall um, and the hike to get down there was not trivial. I just won't go too into detail about that, but we'll say there's mud up to your knees for a solid part of it. Um, but, you know, I knew that it was facing west. So in the morning, the light would not have illuminated the cave. It would have been very hard to photograph. It would have been too dark because um, the, the light would have been coming from behind it. But if I shot it while the sun was up in the afternoon, then the direct light on the water would have absolutely killed the image. So I knew I had to take this photo right after sunset when the light is still soft and illuminating the inside of the cave, but there's no direct light on the water. So just thinking about those types of things in advance and planning, really applying that critical thinking, that's essential for getting good long exposure photos. So definitely make sure that you're always planning and considering these things well in advance. The second is about composition. Um, so of course, any type of photography, finding a composition is important, but when you're taking a long exposure of moving water, there's a whole new side of it. Remember that a long exposure creates compositional elements that were not there before. So you need to approach composition differently than you would for most images. I tell people who come on workshops with me, uh, especially waterfall workshops, that you shouldn't just take a long exposure because you can. You should take a long exposure because it's intentional and because you're doing something with it that adds to your image. Um, so you should always be looking with intention how to apply this particular technique. So in this image, I use long exposure to create a dynamic flow through the image where the waterfall in the background, the midground, in the foreground, and the flow of the moving water draws the viewer's eye through this image. And this is done intentionally to create a literal flow through the image using the flow of the water. So you need to be thinking about how you can use the dimension of time to add something of value to your photo. So when you're planning your composition, always make sure that that's what you're doing. Don't just take a long exposure because you can. So these are other examples of that. In both of these images, I've used different techniques to add a compositional element with the long exposure. And these are elements that may not have been able to be seen without one. 
So on the image on the left, I'm using it as a leading line um, flowing out from the waterfall and towards the lower left corner. And this is a new compositional element. Without long exposure, you would not get the shape. So in the image on the right, instead of using it as a leading line, I've used it as the focal point of the image. So it's uh, the foliage itself is creating a leading line into the flowing water. So I've been thinking about how you can use water and long exposure as a compositional element. And I'm trying to make sure that anytime I apply it, that is adding something of value to that image. A little bit about my process. So what I do first is I always add a polarizer and a graduated filter if it isn't needed in that particular image. So polarizers, anytime you have water in your image, you should immediately thinking about whether or not a polarizer is gonna be helpful for that photo. And there's a really good chance that it will bring something of value. Um, so just quickly, a polarizer is where it's, a, it's usually a circular filter and it's gonna cancel out glare. So when you apply a polarizer to waterfall images, you're removing the glare from the rocks uh, and from the water so that you can really see the true saturated colors of the scene that's in front of you. Nisi has recently come out with a landscape polarizer, which I use and I absolutely love it. It does a really great job of punching up those greens and making the scene feel very lively. Um, and it just works tremendously well. So I almost always am applying a polarizer. Same with a graduated filter. Um, I often will be using it to control a high dynamic range scene. So waterfalls are often in valleys because the water is falling. Um, so if you have a sky above you, it's gonna be much, much brighter than the waterfall itself. And a graduated filter can be super helpful in toning down the brightness of the sky so that you can create a single image instead of blending multiple exposures together. I know that there's multiple ways to do this. Many people prefer to blend, but for my particular style of image, I always try and get my image in a single shot. So I often will use graduated filters. And of course, critical thinking, this is probably the number one most overlooked thing that people need to be doing when they're out in the field. It seems so obvious to apply critical thinking, but I promise when you walk up on the perfect scene and the light is just right, oftentimes that critical thinking is gonna go right out the window because you're just gonna grab your camera and start shooting. Um, but critical thinking is so, so essential when you're talking about long exposures. Um, Especially when you're talking about moving water, the rate of flow of the water determines how many seconds are needed to create an appropriately exposed uh, image. So when I mean the rate of flow of the water, it's how much water is flowing, how fast is it flowing, um, and that's going to determine how long of an exposure you need. If the water is just really pouring over that cliff edge, then you're not gonna need nearly as much time as you would for the scene in this image where the water is more of a trickle. So I call it the Goldilocks shutter speed. You're looking for a shutter speed that's not too long, not too short, it's just right. And this takes a little bit of practice to get, but quickly, the more that you practice it, the more you'll know intuitively when you approach a scene about how many seconds you'll need for a good exposure. Now, the reason that this is so important is that for this image, this waterfall was just gushing and it's a huge waterfall, very high rate of flow. And I knew that I did not need a very long exposure for this. If I had taken a multi-second exposure, that waterfall would have just been a white blur. There would have been no detail in it. Um, it would have just been very overexposed in the water. It would have been hard to recover the highlights. And I like a little bit more texture in my waterfall. So I went with a shorter shutter speed. And that contrast to this waterfall, um, which the water is barely flowing, it's more of a trickle. And if you wanna get nice, smooth, blurred water, you're gonna need a longer exposure to do that. So eight seconds was a much more appropriate shutter speed for this particular waterfall. And again, as you do this more and more, you will intuitively start to know 
but it helps to just use that critical thinking and think how long of a shutter speed do I actually need? Because you're looking for that Goldilocks shutter speed where you haven't erased all of the detail, but you're still able to get a full flow of water from top to bottom. And the final step, which is adding the ND filter and calculating your exposure. So there's a lot of different ways to actually calculate your exposure. Um, oftentimes for waterfalls, you're not using extremely long exposures. So live view is typically adequate. You can literally just see that the exposure is appropriate. Um, there are also apps. So Nisi has their own exposure calculator app. There's also PhotoPills and many others. And um, the conversion table, which I'll show you in a moment, I found the conversion table very helpful when I was just learning because you can quickly reference it and just immediately dial in your settings. So this is a conversion table that I made for myself. Um, you're welcome to take a screenshot of it. And this is, I found this really helpful when I was learning. I literally just printed it out and had it laminated. It was just in my camera bag. Um, that way I could quickly reference it. So if you want to learn how to read a conversion table, it's pretty intuitive. So just spend a little bit of time with it. And there's also many tutorials online, but it is a really helpful tool. Of course, you can also use the apps, but I tend to be a little old school when it comes to that kind of thing. So people often ask me about what tools I actually am using to create these images. And I know I mentioned polarizers already, but I'm gonna mention them again. Uh, polarizers for long exposures, especially when they involve water, for me, that is, is an essential tool. So Nisi does have the newer landscape polarizer and it's just fabulous. It, it's really fantastic. Um, it's just, this was a totally lackluster, absolute flat light scene, but the polarizer brought a lot of that rich color back to life. And I actually ended up with some pictures that I liked from this location, which originally I thought was just impossible. Um, for waterfalls, I typically will use a soft graduated filter because I just want that very soft feather from top to bottom. So um, these are the square for the square filter system. These are what some of the graduated filters look like. There are many different types, but I tend to go for a soft or a medium graduated filter. And if if I had to only have one ND filter for the rest of my life, it would be the six stop ND filter. I found it to be extremely versatile for most situations and it is my go-to ND filter for most waterfalls. So of course there are many different types of ND filters out there. And if you are able to, you should explore using all of them from a three stop, six, 10, and even higher. But the ND filter is definitely the one that gets used the most in my bag. Another question I am often asked is about the merits between square and round filter systems. Now, there are many round filter systems, including Nisi's, uh, that are fantastic. And it's not so much a matter of the quality of them, but the function. So for me and my personal use, I gravitate towards the square filter system. And the reason for that is because I stack a lot of filters. So I will use a circular polarizer and a graduated filter and an ND filter. So once you start stacking, um, it is really helpful to have a square filter system because they are very, very versatile and allow you to quickly change the components in and out and make adjustments on the fly. Also, it is very good for avoiding vignetting once you start stacking filters on top of each other. So if you're using a wide angle lens, you, uh, a square filter system typically is better for avoiding vignetting issues. But ultimately, there are fantastic manufacturers for both types of systems. So don't throw out what you have. Just consider whether or not it is the right one for your needs. And for me, I tend to move towards the square system. So the end result of this passion project was I spent about eight weeks in the field and I hiked to over 200 waterfalls. I know my legs couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> it was arduous, but it was so much fun. I enjoyed every moment of it. I definitely created new memories that were more positive from the last time I was up there. 
And it made me really appreciate this incredibly unique region. So the Blue Ridge Mountains will forever have a place in my heart. Also by the end of it, I would say that I felt I had mastered the technique of long exposure. And I feel really comfortable now taking the skills that I learned with waterfalls and applying them even to other scenarios that I could encounter in the field, whether that's traffic trails or streaking clouds, any skill that you learn with long exposure, it complements many of the other uses of that technique. So any type of investment you can do in learning how to apply that skill yourself, it's gonna translate into so much and it will open so many creative doors for you. And of course, by the end of it, I created a free guidebook. You can download it on my website if you like. Um, it is in the resources tab on my website. It's just, uh, I compiled all this knowledge from doing all these hikes and I figured, well, I should probably put that together for other people. So it's a guidebook that talks about some of my favorite locations, why I love them, how to reach them, and of course, the best places to get photos of them. So I want to wrap up um, just the bottom line of what we talked about today is that adding a fourth dimension, which is time to your image, can be really, really powerful. It provides contrast between the smooth water or whatever element you've smoothed and some of the other textured elements in your image, whether that's rocks or mountains or whatever other item that provides textural contrast. It also creates new compositional elements, whether that's the leading line of traffic or the streaking of clouds, or in this case, the flow of water. So it's introducing elements that you can't unlock otherwise. It also allows you to alter the emotional tone of a scene so that you can bring forth your own artistic vision of what that landscape should look like. And my favorite is that it's letting the viewer time travel through your photo and that's just cool. So finally, I just wanna say that passion projects are really excellent ways to refine your skills. So I highly advocate that you take time and pick a passion project to really focus down on whatever technique you wanna perfect is. In my case, it was long exposures. For you, it could be anything, but hopefully this presentation has inspired you to go pick up some filters and try something new. And of course, I talked about the gear. Having the right tools does make a huge difference in whether or not this is a pleasant experience for you. So having the wrong types of filters or filters that cause vignetting issues that's just going to make this a very frustrating experience for you. So I highly, highly recommend that you invest the time and the money to find the good tools that are going to make this a great learning experience. Um, if you have questions about filters, especially NISI filters, please reach out to me. All of my information is at the bottom of the screen. Um, again, it's Taylor with no Y in it. So finding me online is always a test of whether or not you can spell my name. Um, so you can reach out to me anytime. I'm very uh, accessible to you and I will be happy to help you step into the right filters. So either me or Jem, we are very available for that. So I, I really enjoy getting people seated with the right equipment. So don't hesitate to reach out. So without further ado, I will uh, leave this up and see if we have any questions. Taylor, uh, been answer, answering some questions while you were actually presenting. Uh, the only question that is remains from earlier in the show was um, you were showing two pictures um, at the same time and they were waves and the right one seems to take away how the ocean really is. Do you think it's a matter of taste on how you prefer to shoot? I think Definitely. this when you were showing a frozen, like the, you know, fast shutter speed and then a slow shutter speed, you know, and, you know, I, I mean, on my end, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. If you love the, if you love the shot. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I know, I know which slide you're referring to. So that's what I'm talking about when I uh, mentioned the emotional tone. So using long exposure allows you to control that. So you can make a choice whether or not you want to calm the ocean and create a more serene experience for your viewer. But if you love the angry waves, if you definitely keep that shutter speed up, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it just is an additional tool for you to use in your toolbox to control the emotional tone and make a creative choice in how you want to portray that scene. 
So there's also um, a question that uh, no uh, ISO was uh, apparent in your metadata. Mm. Um, yeah, so they, it does have ISO down there on, it should be all of them. So perhaps that that was a miss, but if you review the recording, then you should be able to see the ISO. Yeah, this, this will be online. Uh, any tricks to keeping waterfall spray off the filters? Oh can boy. I, can I say something about this? <laughs> sure, go ahead. I'm just gonna say this cause I am the Nisi rep. I don't wanna bang anyone's uh, head with, a, with, a, with the Nisi bat, but our filters actually do repel water Mm -hmm. And you can do a quick swipe with a with a microfiber cloth, or our little cute little clever cleaner, and um, and do that. As far as tricks for keeping water spray off the filters, <laughs> oh uh, well, there's there's two of them. Um, so Jim hit on the first one, which is uh, getting a filter with a nano coating really really helps because the water just will beat up, and you can easily wipe it off, and it doesn't leave streaks. So that goes back to having the right gear for the job. Um, and then the second point is, uh, you would laugh at me, it's really shameful, it feels, <laughs> but it's a technique. So I'll use a microfiber cloth and if I'm close to the water, spray is getting on it, I will compose my scene, get everything right, and I will literally drape the cloth over that filter and hit a two second timer. And right at the moment before the shutter opens, I rip the cloth off and when the shutter is done, I put it right back over. It is imperfect but it is the best I can work with. <laughs> what, a, what about any condensation or fogging? Is that ever an issue when you're shooting in oh, yeah. humid or is there? Yeah, I mean, so we, when you have a weather sealed camera, it really, really helps. Um, but occasionally I have had instances where some type of humidity, especially if I change lenses out there, I'll try and avoid it, but it happens. Sometimes you need to do it. and you know, you can get some fogging or condensation between your lens and your camera, which is not ideal. You always wanna avoid that, but sometimes it happens. So um, often that's my cue to take a break um, and I'll step aside and you just wanna crack between the lens and the um, sensor or the body itself and just create a tiny air gap and that usually will dissipate. So it just depends on, how, I mean, that could happen even without waterfalls if it's just super humid out or, um, you know, it's just one of those things. You just troubleshoot, troubleshoot, troubleshoot. There's no perfect system. So now, there's a question for Dan, from Dan. It says, I have a variable ND filter and it's splotchy at the higher settings. Mm -hmm. Is there a cure other than buying a better brand? Uh, a better brand will help, but I'm going to actually tell you something that um, beca I became aware of since I've been working with uh, Nisi, which is sometimes when you use a very heavy, dense, neutral density filter and you're using a DSLR, you should make sure that you block the viewfinder with either the built-in blind or cover it in some way because light during a long exposure can actually come in through the viewfinder and cause some uh, magenta or red uh, artifacts to show up on your image. And uh, we sometimes get complaints, your filters are causing a, a, a red mark on my pictures. And it, it finally came from the, uh, the uh, overlords in uh, Sydney, Australia that I work for who've been doing this for years that uh, it's actually, there can be, there can be um, uh, light pollution going through the, uh, through the viewfinder. Right. Also modern, the most modern filters Nisi, of course, uh, all uh, filter down into the infrared range because sensors in digital cameras are sensitive to infrared. So if you don't have like relatively new filters that are that have the IR technology, you could wind up with some casts there. But I will say right. that our variable ND filters are, are extremely, always highly rated, always really well reviewed and, um, and available at B&H. How do you like that? Uh, <laughs> what do you What do you know about light painting, Taylor? Any what? Yeah, quite a bit. Well, in what uh, in what context is the question? Well, Cat had Cat, one of our viewers, had asked mm -hmm. earlier if an ND filter would help with light painting, 
And I answered that, well, it would help because you won't be recorded on the sensor while you're painting with light if you use a, a an ND will help that. But yeah. she was wondering in that cave shot, if you could have, if you couldn't have gotten there at the right time, could you have painted the oh, uh, yeah. cave with light? Yeah, I definitely, I could have. Um, I mean, that that is an option, right? Is if I didn't shoot it at that particular time of day when the light bounced in there naturally, I, I could have used a secondary light source to uh, bounce the light off as well. So yeah, that's definitely a technique. And there's no reason not to use light painting with an ND filter in that type of situation if it's helpful. Although of course, at, at night or something, I, I probably wouldn't use them, but Jim is right that you could possibly find an application allowing you to have a longer shutter speed so that you could paint more, um, but it also will cut down on the light that's transmitted through. So there's a give and a take there. I'm not sure that I would use it in that application, but definitely for the cave, yeah, I could have used a secondary light source. Now there's the next question is any tips for keeping focus when using a screw and filter? And I, uh, what I will say is if you have mm -hmm. an ND filter, you have to do manual focus. Are you right? Is that right? Well, it depends. Um, so with like a six stop, if there's plenty of light, generally your camera will focus straight through it and it's not an issue. You really only get into a problem when either there's very little ambient light or you're using a 10 stop filter or more. Um, in which case, yes, you will need to manually focus it. And if you're applying a screw on filter, that is going to be trouble. Um, so I know exactly what issue they're talking about, which is that you've pre-focused, you switch it to manual, now it's time to add the ND filter. And if you have a screw on filter, there's a good chance that you're gonna push that, that zoom on that lens. And if you don't have the ability to lock your lens, um, you could alter your focus. So it, it is a big problem. It's another reason that I personally like the square filters because I can just reach over and clip it on and I haven't messed with the, the focusing at all. Cool. So uh, Sydney asks, how do you determine exposure when you stack filters? Is that info on your table? Ever, ever stack three filters? Uh, well, yeah. So let, let me flip back over to the your calculation table, just bear with me one moment. Of course, again, there are many ways to uh, calculate this, but I'll just use the table. This is, um, and of course you can screenshot this if you like, or you can Google them and find them online. Um, this is just the one I made for, for myself because I'm OCD like that. Um, so generally you're looking at your baseline shutter speed, which is this top row that's without the ND filter, but with the polarizer or graduated filter. Um, so no ND filter, this is what your starting shutter speed is. And if you add however many stops of light, whether it's a six stop rate on this row, then you just move over and that'll tell you your exposure. And of course, this is a, the calculation is pretty helpful. There may be some fine tuning that needs to be involved. And ultimately, if you're talking about how to calculate, there's a whole mathematical thing behind that. Um, so it, it's really maybe best suited to learn that outside of this webinar format, um, or you could message me and I'm happy to discuss it with you. I'm more than happy to take the time and teach that. Um, so yeah, uh, generally speaking, if you're using like a six stop filter um, and there's plenty of light, then you should be able to uh, literally use your live view to calculate an appropriate shutter speed. So just using live view, or if you have mirrorless, it's gonna be exposure simulation on your screen. And you know, as long as there's plenty of light in it, like a six stop or less, then you should be able to eyeball it. But if you wanna get into the math of it, you could use a conversion app like what Nisi has or photo pills or a conversion table. Yeah, hopefully Taylor, that answers your question. Taylor, you had mentioned um, your, you know, the Goldilocks methodology in regards yeah. to water flow, which is brilliant. I never even thought about the speed of the water or uh, the flow of the water having anything yeah. to do with it. But in regards to certain things such as leaves shaking, if you have, uh, uh, that's something yeah. that I think trips up me. I know when I've tried to do long exposures, it's like, great, I got the water to look nice, but it always looks unpolished when you have the yeah. blur in the trees as well. Is there... Any certain tip yes. you have for that? Definitely, absolutely. So 
it's often, you know, it's very unideal to be photographing waterfalls when it's windy, right? The leaves are going to be moving everywhere. It can be really, like you said, very unpolished looking. Um, so if you, if that is going to bother you and that's totally fine. Um, sometimes I do this as well. There are, uh, there's two things that you can do to avoid this being a problem. The number one thing that you can do is to compose your image in such a way that the moving elements, the, the tree branches, are not in the way of uh, the flow of the water. Okay, and there's, you know, there's a good reason for this, right? One, it's very distracting. So if you have blur across the water, it's super distracting. And the second is that it makes it almost impossible to blend in a faster shutter speed shot so that you can create a more crisp image. So first thing you're going to do is make sure that the moving object, the leaves or the branch is not in front of the blurred water, right? Then the second thing you need to do is before, when you're setting up your shot, you're composing it, there's no ND filter on, right? So get your shot set up, properly expose it, take a shot with a faster shutter speed, add your ND filter, lengthen your shutter speed, and then when you ha get home, you have two images and they should be exposed almost identical, right? Because you have your non-ND filter that's properly exposed and then your shot using the ND filter that is also properly exposed, hopefully. And what you can do is that you can use Photoshop to blend these images together. And this is why it's important to make sure the moving object is not in front of the flowing water because you can just brush in uh, the sharper leaves from that faster shutter speed image. But you can't do that if it's over the moving water or it would be painfully tedious. So you just wanna make sure that you're composing in a way that's gonna help you later. And that's, that's where the critical thinking comes in. Like really think when you're taking these shots about how do I wanna compose this? How do I need to edit this later? Perfect. Thank you for that. And I know you mentioned Photoshop, but we did have a question earlier regarding what mm -hmm. you use to post process. Is it just Photoshop? Do you use any other programs? I almost exclusively use Lightroom. So even though I just mentioned Photoshop, I, I would say there, there are a few times where I do that. And that's just, that's my personal thing. I really get deep uh, creative satisfaction out of getting an image in a single photo. I really, that is what I strive for. And there's sometimes it's unavoidable uh, and I will use Photoshop if I need to, but I, I really mostly stick with Lightroom. Okay. Now, Taylor, I don't know if both you and Jim want to opine on this. If one of you, if you guys feel the same on screw in filters versus the square filters, is there any that you find uh, works better for you for certain applications or do you have any opinion on the two? Yeah, I'm, I, I can just speak to that. Um, I did mention in there that I really do prefer the square filters. Although of course, um, in terms of quality, there are amazing products of both styles. Um, but for me, if you are using a wide angle lens a lot, and if you are stacking filters, a square filter system is going to be a better fit for you. Um, and the reason is because you avoid vignetting issues if you're using a wide angle lens a lot. And if you're stacking filters, again, vignetting and also just the logistics of how do I attach all these filters? And if you need to make adjustments, it can be very cumbersome. So for waterfalls, you're often using a polarizer, a graduated filter and an ND filter. So you have bare minimum three filters going on at one time. I really need a square system so that it's quick and versatile and easy to use. No, that's- Not, uh, Yeah, go uh, ahead, Jim. You know, being that Nisi does make a full range of circular filters as well as square filters, the, uh, you know, we get that question all the time in our mm -hmm. customer service line. And really it's what suits you better. The, um, the big advantage to round threaded filters are they're very, very um, convenient. They're yeah. lightweight, they're convenient. Uh, th there's not a lot of moving parts. And for example, we, um, we have a six stop filter with a polarizer integrated into it. So it's one filter, a circular filter that you can carry. And I, I kind of coined the term that it's our water flow filter because it's something that you could take along with you that's very simple 
that will allow you to do polarization to get reflection off the surface of the water, as well as getting six stop, which as, as Taylor said, is kind of the sweet spot for, um, you know, doing this kind of water flow, water flow photography. Uh, the other thing that was um, quickly, uh, that was asked was, uh, you know, you're very much concentrating in this uh, webinar about waterfalls, but what about other elements uh, mm -hmm. that might benefit from longer exposure? Do you consider those and can you combine those and, and what, what, else, what else can be enhanced by long exposure? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, at, at the beginning, I very, very quickly uh, just stepped through some other applications. But I mean, the creative applications are just huge. Once you really master the long exposure skill of how to use ND filters and how to lengthen your shutter speed, I mean, you're unlocking this whole creative world. Like you can seascapes, which is another water feature, rivers, smoothing water in lakes or getting perfect reflection shots, um, streaking the clouds to create a dynamic image. I like to do a lot of traffic trails too. I find that really fun. Um, so there, there are so many ways to apply these techniques. And really, if you just learn one of them, you can take that skill and kind of easily apply it into all of the other creative applications. So it's really nice to be able to learn one thing, get really good at it and say, okay, well now how do I do this? And how do I do this? And how do I apply it to all these other cool skills? So um, there, there are many ways to use long exposures. Um, another popular one that I didn't mention at all is removing people or cars out of your image. So if you've ever seen a picture of like Times Square with nobody in it, I mean, I promise you there's people there. You just can't see it. So you're taking multi-minute exposures so that you can totally remove people or cars out of the scene. And that's a really, really cool way to use it. Wonderful. Well, guys Taylor, Jim, yeah. this All was right. great. Any, any closing words? No, you guys, yeah. you guys always get the last word if there's any closing well, words. I just want to say that I really hope that uh, this presentation inspired you to go try something new. I mean, you just unlock this new creative potential that you've learned about. It's not that hard. It's not that intimidating. All it takes is practice. If I can do it, anyone can. Um, but also, I just want to say that I am very accessible. I answer my DMs. I answer my emails. If you have questions about filters, just message me. I will help you. I'm here. I'm a resource. And, uh, you know, welcome to the photography team. <laughs> and I guess my closing statement is, is that um, if you want to save a little money on filters, uh, B&H sells our filters and kits, and mm -hmm. that will save money. And um, you know, watch watch the sales, watch the deals of the day. If you um, if you register for our newsletter or follow Nisi on Instagram, and it's at Nisi Optics USA. If B and H is running a special, we'll always uh, say now's the time to go there and buy. Well, then I guess my closing words is whatever they said. That sounded great. <laughs> if you have questions, we have Taylor there. Uh, Jim's saying go shop at B&H, so I, I'm not going to tell you otherwise, but huge thank you to uh, Nisi for sponsoring today's event. Huge thank you for Taylor for taking her time out to provide her, us with her expertise on long exposures, some beautiful work, some great tips, and wonderful information from you both. So huge thank you to you, to all of our viewers, as always. Can't do it without you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in, as always. But this wraps it up for another rendition of the BNH virtual event space. We will catch you all next time. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys.